We've had a lot of discussion within the government lately about efficiency. And uh, there's a number of arguments for how we can be efficient. I like to argue that, in fact, there's some benefits to the warfighter from going very fast that can improve the way we efficiently do things. Now, to communicate that with an audience of this type and to get into some of the concepts can be somewhat difficult. So I'd like to instead to, to use a business case model for something I think we're all familiar with and something I'm very excited about, namely pizza delivery. So imagine if AFRL went into the pizza delivery business. And let's say we've got 15 minutes to deliver a pizza someplace. Why 15 minutes? Because by the time the social cultural modeling guys and the lawyers get involved determining whether somebody really actually does want a pizza and whether they're entitled to a pizza, say we've got 15 minutes to deliver something. So from the home office in Dayton, Ohio, if I want to deliver this pizza at, say, on a tomahawk or some other high-speed conventional system, I can reach uh, all of Indiana and Kentucky, uh, West Virginia, parts of Michigan, etc. But if I want to cover a greater part and have a larger business, I've got to open franchises in a number of other places. And opening that franchise means I need to secure real estate, facilities, secure supply lines, train people. Uh, I've got a lot of other complications that go into being able to ensure I've got a broad delivery coverage. If I deliver that same pizza at Mach 6, I'd cover all the United States except with the exception of the West Coast, which means I no longer have the risk of franchise openings in different places where I'm not familiar, I don't have to work with these things, I don't have to invest in the real estate, supply lines, et cetera. So I think there's an economical benefit to fielding a high-speed system where when you think at the tip of the spear, wow, that's really expensive, why would we want to go that fast? If you look at the integrated issue and the entire benefit to the warfighter, I think some, there's some efficiency benefits to being able to respond very quickly, uh, particularly for time-critical issues. Now, my portfolio is associated with the external environment uh, around a high-speed system. Uh, it determines ultimately whether or not we're able to actually get that pizza there at all, how accurately we might be able to get it there, and uh, if we do our jobs well, how economically and efficiently we can do that as well. Uh, this is our standard overview slide. My uh, portfolio works on identifying, modeling, and exploiting critical physical phenomena in turbulent and high-speed flows. And as I'll speak more in a few minutes, we're really shifting our emphasis to energy transfer mechanisms. Uh, and I'll get more, about, more into that in a few minutes. But we are the only DOD basic research program that addresses the basic science issues in this area. And uh, as a result, we have a lot of partners that we cooperate with, um, including NASA and Sandia Labs. We work together there under the uh, ASDRNE Joint Technology Office for Hypersonics. Uh, we work closely with AFRL RQ and the Australian government on the High Fire program. Internationally, we coordinate with a lot of our uh, peer organizations. Uh, in Europe and other places through the NATO Research and Technology Organization. I work with ONR and NASA on things like jet noise, and I try and transition the accomplishments from our portfolio uh, through places like the Test and Evaluation Centers, Arnold Engineering Development Center, and DARPA. Now, I'll begin with a discussion of some of the scientific challenges we face in the portfolio, and then I'll give you a little bit of big picture of what I think is going on nationally in high speeds, and then I'm going to spend more time than I typically would on portfolio management involving research directions because I'm in the middle of trying to get the community to view the work in my portfolio in a different light. And I'll take a few extra minutes to get into that. And with the time remaining, I'd like to show you some what I think are some very compelling research highlights. And if I do my job well today, um, I hope you will conclude that we are in fact leading the international research community in this area and we're identifying and responding to new scientific opportunities as we move forward with the portfolio. So uh, my portfolio exists at the intersection of shock waves, turbulence, thermal physics, and chemistry. Uh, this is actually a two-dimensional solution of flow over the uh, portfolio initials, Mach 10. There's actually a chemistry model involved here. Uh, it introduces, allows me to introduce a new scientific concept as well, the Reynolds number based on font size. So you can see from some of the detailed structure here, et cetera, that there's a number of, of interesting things that we have to deal with. Strong gradients and excitation of the chemical species of the gas, a detailed turbulent structure, the interplay of these various things, and the underlying theme through a lot of this is that rate-dependent energy transfer processes are critical, yet this is the, uh, the, 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 the one area that we really don't grasp well when we understand the physics of these types of flows. So one thing we want to do is move forward in understanding the interplay between the various energy mechanisms that govern these types of flow fields. Now, we work in a challenging environment. Throughout this week, you've seen a lot of, of research from our physics and electronics groups 
and a lot of great tools that we also use in my portfolio. Things like spectroscopy, uh, molecular uh, dynamic simulations. Uh, but the thing is, we kind of apply them in a manner analogous to, say, these extreme athletes. While you may see a very pristine, clean room uh, in some of the other type portfolios, we go out and get grease on our fingernails and try and do something in large shock tube facilities. So imagine, if you will, taking a couple of school buses of length of air and then rapidly compressing it to the energy density of dynamite, then expanding it through a pipe you know, about with a cross-sectional area of the throat of maybe an inch or smaller, expanding it to maybe 10,000 miles per hour, then trying in the span of a few hundred millionths of a second to test time to actually measure the species composition of that gas and look at the detailed flow structure. That's the type of thing we try and, and take on as we look at the fundamental science issues in my portfolio. Fortunately, we have unprecedented tools that allow us to really dig into these detailed phenomena, things like high fidelity numerical simulations. We're recently seeing uh, the transition from chemistry to aerothermodynamic application of molecular gas dynamic simulations. Uh, Ali showed this picture a few minutes ago. Things like spectroscopic measurements in the near field region looking at the emission of uh, different materials from the surface here. These are all tools that we try to utilize to learn more about the science. I want to mention one other opportunity I have that I think is not really well known. There is no mature industry base for hypersonic systems. Meaning, if we have a breakthrough in my portfolio this year, next year we can see it implemented within a technology development program. There is no inertia of existing systems that stand in our way that keep us from being able to rapidly transition and have an impact of what we're doing uh, in this area and actually changing the game nationally uh, in a fairly rapid fashion. So this is a perspective of kind of the big picture of high-speed flows. At the top, we see uh, your, your marquee programs, things that are on the cover of AvWeek. I get really excited about these programs. This is nice to see things going there. But one thing we don't want to conclude falsely is that we know everything we need to do. There's a lot of good scientific research that has to be done still in order to, at the end of the day, realize some of these capabilities. Um, now, at the top level, this effort is coordinated nationally by the Joint Technology Office for Hypersonics uh, through ASDR and Jimmy Kenny does a fantastic job of pulling the community together there. At the foundational research end, uh, Air Force, NASA, and Sandia investments invest in the basic science that is going to allow us to uh, do the next generation of these types of systems. Uh, our current budget, say for the fiscal year 11, is shown here on the right. This is a total national investment in the science of hypersonics. And again, it's from three agencies. Uh, one thing that I have concern about is the fact that NASA and FY13 is scheduled to zero out their hypersonics program. So a significant part of our partnership and capabilities is scheduled to go away. We will respond. We are resilient. And uh, we'll figure out a way to do it. But I want to note that there's probably a considerable part of our national government expertise lies within the NASA capabilities. And we're going to have to figure out how to take advantage of that in these dynamic times. Um, one thing we try and do, again, this is an example of transition from my portfolio to some of the uh, demonstration types that programs I showed on the last page. And this is in partnership uh, with Arnold Engineering Development Center in DARPA. So we're going to start with this picture up here on the right. This is a, a Schlieren image of a second mode acoustic instability. It's a boundary instability uh, in Mach 10. Now there's a handful of instabilities that drive the process from laminar to turbulent flow. And this is just one of them, but this one this will pop up periodically through my talk, so remember this. Second mode acoustic instability acts like a trapped sound wave within the boundary layer. Now when these things start life, they have fluctuations on the order of, a, say, a millionth of the mean flow conditions in the flow field, so ridiculously small. And we want to try and understand how they grow and amplify and drive the flow to go from a laminar to a turbulent state. I think Doug did a great job of introducing that in his talk earlier. Now, when that transition occurs, particularly for high-speed flows, the boundary layer becomes more energetic, surface heat transfer can increase up to a factor of seven, almost an order of magnitude, when we go from laminar to turbulent flows. This becomes one of the prime design drivers for hypersonic systems. We need to understand how the physics of this works so that we can take account for that in the development of future high-speed capabilities. Now, my portfolio has developed numerical estimation tools coupled with basically computational fluid dynamics and stability tracking and evolution tools that allow us to use high fidelity simulations to track the development of these very, very small instabilities, how they develop within a complex flow field. 
We also are trying to have developed capabilities to actually measure these, again, acoustic perturbations within the boundary layer. It's much harder than you think it would be. Uh, and by coupling these together, we've got some really interesting insight. But when we pull the third component in, out of the test and evaluation community, uh, temperature sensitive paint development, now we have an opportunity to predict the growth of instabilities that drive these high thermal uh, re uh, heating phenomena on these vehicles, to actually measure their presence on the vehicle itself, and to assess the global impact of these phenomena. So now we have incredible insight into the fundamental physical phenomena that drive thermal loads on these systems. Now prior to implementing this, we would do force and moment testing, maybe measure with some thermocouples where the various uh, temperature peaks were. But now we've got a revolutionary capability to look at the sources of heating, how it develops, and its global impact. This is being implemented in the testing of the HTV2 configuration at ADC Tunnel 9. These guys can be really busy in the next couple of years, and a lot of the systems they're going to start looking at are going to implement this new capability as well. Now, another key, I think, contribution we can make that I want to emphasize is we can be a catalyst in the community. So um, the first example I'd like to show is a workshop we did a few years ago. We brought together Air Mobility Command and the NASA Environmental Responsive Aerospace Program. Uh, ERA is looking at new systems for uh, improved uh, efficiency of, of, of lift and transport systems, next generation of, say, our airline configurations. Uh, Air Mobility Command would like to take advantage of that. I think in the future, as they move out, there's going to be a partnership that develops between these two organizations. And, and that partnership began when we introduced them at an AFOSR-sponsored workshop on development of efficient methods for, for, uh, for transportation systems. Uh, a few years ago, we realized that there was not a good scientific venue for looking at the science issues with regard to coupled air thermodynamics material response, the ablation problem. And so we started a workshop on ablation bottling jointly with NASA and Sandia, and it's run great for the last five years. Starting next year, this workshop becomes a Gordon Research Conference on the uh, physics of reentry systems. We're really excited about that. And then at the end of this month, um, we're organizing a workshop with the Joint Technology Officer Hypersonics again. Uh, and we're going to look at how to transition some of our mature and proven research tools into application in industry so that we can, in fact, improve the design and analysis of some of these high-speed systems that we are very interested in as a country right now. Now, um, I'm very proud of my PI team. I've got a list of a number of them shown here. We have like six members of the National Academy of Engineering, members on the various DOD advisory boards, a number of AIAA fellows. Uh, let's talk about AIAA awards. Right now, my portfolio holds the grand slam in the AIAA fluids community. We are the current holders of the fluid dynamics, plasma dynamics and lasers, ground test, and aerodynamic measurement technology. All four, it's kind of like the Tiger Woods slam. Um, in that they're consecutive years. Two of them are from 2011, two are from 2012, but the 2012 haven't been announced, et cetera. And now, we're holding all four right now. I'm very proud of that. We're kind of like the SEAL Team 6 of science in this area here. So, We've had a lot of accomplishments. Perhaps, though, the question we want to ask is, maybe it's time to change things. Right now, we're dominant and highly accomplished in a specific area. I think we have the intellectual capabilities and the resources to reach out and have a broader impact than just the aerodynamics community we're working in right now. And, and so I'd like to think about how we can possibly do that. But before we do that, I want to go back and look at some of the highlights I've shown in the last 11 times I've given this talk as, as a program manager. Um, and I'll just hit a couple of points here. So uh, Candler and Martin looked at the control of turbulent fluctuations through endothermic or exothermic reactions within the flow. Uh, CEREC looked at uh, the control of instability growth by competing different types of instabilities and ensuring that the slow growing instability won, uh, and therefore allowing him to delay transition. We've looked at the attenuation of these acoustic waves I've talked about in acoustically absorptive surfaces. This is a very interesting one down here, and I'll get into a little more detail. Um, it turns out carbon dioxide wants to absorb, be vibrationally excited in the same uh, frequency bandwidth as that acoustic instability I talked about earlier. So when you introduce carbon dioxide into the boundary layer, it wants to internally get the vibrational modes excited in the same bandwidth as that acoustic instability. So I can exploit that and transfer energy from the acoustic disturbance into the excited internal energy state of the carbon dioxide and delay boundary layer transition. Now, what do these all have in common? These are very influential highlights I've shown in the past. Uh, let's see. 
They all emphasize that energy transfer at the micro and molecular scales drives the macroscopic flow behavior. And so imagine if we could control the transfer of energy with these various states and what we could do to shape the macroscopic behavior of the flow field. Uh, I think there's a lot of merit in doing that, and I'd like to try and take the portfolio to further emphasize that. So right now, we tend to work in the area of aerodynamic-driven phenomena, boundary layers, shock interactions. What if we started thinking about the portfolio with a focus on energy transfer mechanisms? That would allow us to start working with the communities in thermal management, energy storage, atmospheric energy propagation. Uh, I'm excited to talk to, uh, to Rick Pear about some of his ablation work and, and material uh, interactions with lasers as well. Uh, the key thing we have to do is I've got to get my PI core to start considering these, this aspect and communicating this in the way they communicate their work and the way they communicate their proposals. So this is essentially a coordinate shift within my portfolio, the one we're trying to take on. If we do this right, we're going to start reaching out and interacting with other portfolios within AFOSR. We're going to learn from what's going on in these other things. For example, molecular, gas dyna or molecular dynamic simulations are really shaping what we do right now. There are other things we can learn from chemistry. There's other things we can learn from plasma, from the materials community. We want to start bringing that knowledge in. Uh, we also want to share some of the expertise and capabilities we have with them as well. Uh, we've been very fortunate to receive support for a basic research initiative in this area, and over the next year, we'll be doing things across portfolios in this. I'm, I'm really grateful and, and pleased to have this opportunity to do so. So, um, for the rest of my talk, I'd like to talk about some of the research accomplishments in my portfolio. And we're going to do the Jacobian transformation. I'm going to try and present these results grouped together in terms of uh, the energy transfer mechanisms that are being presented here. Now, these were all started, again, as aerodynamic organ proposals. And you'll find that you know, it's, pretty, it, it's pretty easy to do this. But again, as a fundamental change in what we're thinking about, I'll present them and talk about them in terms of energy transfer mechanisms. So, um, first thing I want to talk about is kinetic energy transfer and turbulent flows. And what we want to understand is how does the energy between the turbulent spectrum and other flow structures shape the macroscopic flow behavior. In this area, we work closely with ONR and NASA, particularly in the area of jet noise. Um, and things such as the radiation of acoustic noise from uh, supersonic jets or the development of, of extreme local phenomena such as uh, acoustic or thermal loads in shock turbulent boundary interactions all depends on the interaction of the physics and the turbulence and these other phenomena. Um, throughout the rest of my talk, I will frequently refer to modeling tools we use to look at turbulent flows. And I'd like to introduce that concept here for those of you who aren't familiar with it. So this is a representation of the turbulent kinetic energy spectrum. Uh, things start in large scales and typically move down towards dissipation in the long, smaller scales where viscous effects finally overcome the turbulent fluctuations. Traditional engineering tools. We think about, I did a computational solution, I used a turbulence model, represent the turbulence, occur here uh, with uh, what's called Reynolds Average Navier-Stokes, or RANS solution. Basically, we've modeled the effects of the entire part of the spectrum. This is fairly easy to do at this point. It's an engineering tool. On the opposite end, direct numerical simulation, computation resolves the entire turbulence spectrum and, and allows us to look at the detailed dynamics between the various uh, fluctuations. This is really expensive and, and prohibitively so for large scales. We can only apply this in very localized regions, limited in size by the Reynolds number. Um, but again, it, it's a first principles approach to turbulence. In the middle, we have something called large eddy simulations, where we will actually model the very smallest turbulent scales and then numerically resolve the large scales. And it helps us to uh, more economically look at the effect of large turbulent fluctuations within the flow field. It is closer to DNS in cost than it is to RANS, uh, but again, it's a useful tool and probably the state of the art in research right now in terms of understanding uh, the roles of turbulence within various types of flow fields. And so, in fact, the first example I'd like to show you is a large eddy simulation of a supersonic jet that's been forced here at the exit of the jet. And this is work from Mo Samimi and Dada Katande at Ohio State. Now, we've got two examples here. In the first example, they force the jet to promote the growth of these structures. And what you can see is there's acoustic waves emanating from these structures here at the jet exit. In the second example, they force the jets so that they can diminish the growth of these structures. And you see there's no such radiation of the noise field here. They're effectively manipulating the growth of the turbulence with the forcing. But we want to understand the details of the physics in a little more detail. Uh, and computational fluid dynamics is a great tool for being able to do that. So what we see in this case here, they've forced it in a certain way. You get these helical structures that develop and, and come off right at the, uh, 
you know, where the shear layer from the jet exit is developing and interacting with the ambient air, what you see is there are a lot of shock waves and ambient noise coming off of these strong structures here. So what we want to try and do is figure out how to break up those structures. Uh, and, and they're, again, doing more work in trying to understand that. Uh, the implications for us in terms of, of the jet noise is, can be seen in our human hearing range here. So for a baseline uncontrolled case, you can see that it's about 120 decibel far field sound level. In the worst case, where they promote uh, the, the development of these structures, it increases about 20 decibels. Uh, they can reduce, or about 15 here, but they can reduce it about 10 by controlling the development of those structures as well. So it has implications for people like the Navy or the Air Force when we want to have things like the JSF on the flight deck. Um, next thing I want to talk about is jet crackle, and we're going to shift to now a direct numerical simulation. This is John Friend's work from the University of Illinois. John is looking at uh, a reduced order model of a shear layer, trying to look at what's a crackle phenomena here. Crackle is particularly uh, applicable to military systems. It doesn't uh, occur on commercial systems. When those noise acoustic waves I talked about in the last slide radiate off, sometimes they coalesce together and form stronger shock waves out away from the jet surface. And you can see the occurrence of such a phenomenon here. What John has done is simulated a Mach 2 shear layer and looked at the dynamic development of the acoustic waves being shed from the large scale structures and how they might coalesce. There's a lot of unknown physics here and he's just starting exploring these things. But one thing he's learned is that the type of uh, wave propagation away from the surface can in fact affect the strength of the shock waves and how they might have a probability of, of coalescing. So in regions where the wave propagates in a spherical fashion, the wave strength attenuates much more quickly. You get weaker shock waves, the sh crackle problem is not as big a deal there. Uh, in regions where the waves propagate in a conical fashion, there's a stronger probability that strong waves will coalesce. Crackle will occur in these regions. Now, whether the propagation occurs in a spherical or conical manner is determined by the structure of the large scale structures in the turbulent flow here. Uh, these determine what types of waves propagate away from the surface. Again, John is starting to learn more of the details here, uh, but it'll be very interesting to see what he comes up with in the next couple years. Um, it's also important to try and measure these types of flow fields. And so Dick Miles at uh, Princeton, who is, by the way, the recipient of the AIAA Plasma Dynamics and Lasers Award for 2012, has got an exciting new technique that is very elegant and something we're very excited about. It's called FLEET. Uh, femtosecond laser electronic excitation tagging. Uh, so I managed to compare notes with Rick Perry later on and, and learn more about some of the things we can take out of his portfolio and start applying within mine. Uh, but Fleet is very, uh, as I said, simple in its approach and in that way elegant and appealing to those of us who work in, in ground testing. So we take a single femtosecond pulse from a laser and excite a line of nitrogen within the flow field, use a fast-gated camera, and track the evolution of that excited nitrogen within the flow field. Um, it's great because it's very simple to implement. Nitrogen is a mainstay of, of ground testing, its primary component of air. And uh, it's got great spatial resolution, temporal resolution, or temperature range. It's a very flexible system. Now here's a result where Dix measured the center line velocity in a jet here. Uh, using the flat technique, and you can see the strong reduction in velocity as the flow moves through the mock stem here at the end of the shock wave, and then as the flow continues to uh, accelerate and decelerate due to the changing geometry of the jet downstream, you can see the change in velocity there as well. Uh, the next highlight is one of, one of our YIPs, and this is a little bit on the fringe for my portfolio. I do a lot of, don't do a lot of structures work, but I'm really excited about this, and the next chart, I think you'll be really impressed with what you see. So this is Jack McNamara from Ohio State. He's working closely with Ravi Chona's group uh, at AFRL, Air Vehicles Directorate. Jack um, is improving the way we integrate air thermodynamic, structural dynamics, and heat transfer simulations for structures. Typically in engineering practice, we'll take each one, compute it separately, linearly superimpose them, and try and figure out what's going on. Jack's accounting for them all together, and he's able to look at some of the nonlinear responses that occur because of that. Now let me get straight to the next slide. Jack is taking that stability analysis tool that I talked about earlier that we transitioned to the test and evaluation community, and he's applying it to flow over a surface with flexible panels on that surface. So the thermal buckling of one of these flexible panels may change the surface structure here. You would think that would be a problem, right? Well, as it turns out, there may be some inherent benefits from doing it this way, and it, that lies in looking at the stability analysis. So what this plot is, is a growth of the amplification factor for an instability in a high-speed boundary layer uh, and the 
rigid surface is shown here in black. As Jack introduces the effects of one, two, or three rigid panels, what we see is counterintuitive. We have a decrease in the amplification rate of that acoustic instability. What's going on, we think, is because the instability tends to scale with the boundary or thickness, as we hit a flexible panel, it creates a local change in the geometry of the boundary layer. We're actually creating a discontinuity, a forced step function in the boundary layer, and the, in the instabilities necessarily don't transmit through that well. You may have different types of instabilities becoming dominant in this case, and so by forcing this discontinuity on the boundary layer, we're disrupting the evolutionary growth of the instabilities throughout the boundary layer. Uh, some very interesting results here. It's highly relevant to the development of uh, future systems for AFRL, and I'm excited to see what Jack comes up with uh, in the next couple of years. Now, uh, next highlight is from Graham Candler. He's the uh, 2012 AIAA Fluid Dynamics Award winner. And uh, I show a lot of Graham stuff. Um, and, and every year I sit down and think, okay, how am I going to show a little less of Graham stuff this year? Because he's got a lot of stuff that, but he's really at the top of his game and very effective in providing me with highlights that I can use. Now, I want to note that Graham and I have a great relationship and we're on the same page. Uh, and so I tease him almost mercilessly with the following thing, that my job is somewhat dual. I both have to support him adequately, continue to do the great job he's doing, and I'm always looking for his replacement. So um, we have a, a great relationship, and, and Graham, I think, uses that as motivation to always give me some very interesting highlights. So Graham is using direct numerical simulation to study the interaction of acoustic waves within a gas that can be excited vibrationally. And if you coordinate the frequency of the acoustic wave with the relaxation rate of the gas, Graham's showing here that you can actually attenuate that wave by absorbing energy in the acoustic wave. We, we've shown that here. Graham's putting numerical uh, backstop, a proper science foundation in place to give us more insight into this phenomenon. But what's really interesting here is he's also helping us understand some of the implications of work in this area. So this is the same chart I showed a few minutes ago for Jack McNamara. Instead of looking at the amplified rate of the instability, though, we're looking at the change in that amplification exponent as a function of distance downstream. And what you can see in the presence of carbon dioxide, we have about a 15% change in the amplification rate of that instability as a result of acoustic absorption of the carbon dioxide molecule. Interesting, cool, we kind of had an idea about that. But what's really exciting to me is now Graham's team has gone back and told me what the contributions of the individual components of the various vibrational modes the carbon dioxide molecule are doing here. So the bending mode of the carbon dioxide molecule contributes uh, the majority of the, or you know, about half of the, ampli or the, of the attenuation of the instability wave. The symmetric bending mode, I'm not sure I can do that, but uh, you know, is, is more of a, you know, a less component. And the anti-symmetric mode is perhaps uh, the least contributing thing. What do we get out of this? If I want to understand new gas molecules that I can introduce to try and attenuate these things, I want to find a nice flapping molecule that I can introduce so that I can try and, and exploit what we learn here to get into, into other gas molecules I might be able to use. Now, the final area I want to talk about is how we need to understand non-equilibrium energy transfer and high enthalpy flows and the energy transfer processes there. This is a 10-year-old highlight. I briefed this in my very first uh, AFOSR scoring review, but I think it's a compelling argument why we want to do this. So under a RTO uh, task group activity, we did a code validation study a few years ago looking at the flow over what's called a double cone configuration here. Um, again, these are Candler simulations uh, for nitrogen, at about four megajoules per kilogram, we get great comparison between the computational and the experimental data. As I in increase the chemical complexity of what I'm trying to simulate, going from now to air, a more chemically complex species, all the way up to, say, 15 megajoules per kilogram, which I learned on Wikipedia is about half the energy density of butter, which was surprising to me and perhaps an aside here, but uh, perhaps one day we will test flows with the same energy density as butter. Uh, but getting to the point here, uh, the trends reverse, and uh, we do a horrible job of, of agreeing the two here. Now, the numerics are the same, flow field is the same, grids are the same. The only thing that's changing here is the chemical complexity uh, of the flow field. So clearly, that's an area where we have to improve our modeling and simulation capabilities. The other thing is, um, here's some experimental data from Mike Holden's facility at Kubrick. Uh, Mike's got two facilities. One is an expansion tunnel, one is a shock tunnel. 
Shock tunnels excite the air, pound it with a shock wave, and then expand it. Expansion tunnels do so in a more gentle fashion by just expanding the gas. Uh, this carbon dioxide at 5 megajoules per kilogram, it's a shuttle configuration sponsored by NASA. Look at the difference in the shock standoff distance here. This was devastating to the aero community when we saw this because no one had any idea this was going to occur. There's a dramatic difference in the shock standoff distance here. The only, and it is a function of how we actually generate the flow field. Apparently, there are energy mechanisms in play here that shape the availability uh, of, of the energy for recombination here in the, in the stagnation region. We don't know what's going on. All we know is we see an effect here. And the only thing we can try and explain this is there are significant energy transfer mechanisms at play here that shape what's going on in this flow. So that brings me to Tom Schwartz and Truber's work. Uh, Tom is one of my young investigators under the YIP program. And Tom is taking information from the chemistry community, essentially the interatomic molecular potentials, using that as the only input and using molecular dynamic simulations to simulate the energy distributions of gases through a shock wave. So this will hopefully give us some new insight into the fundamental physics. It will help us explain some of the phenomena I showed on the last slide. And what Tom's doing here is, uh, first I'll show a couple of results uh, invalidating the work he's done with uh, single atomic species. There's a mixture of uh, noble gases, argon and helium. Uh, what he's shown here basically is that through the shock wave, the lighter helium atoms respond more quickly than the heavier argon atoms. That's uh, known and it shows that things are moving well. Now, of interest here is the new insight into rotational non-equilibrium. So now we introduced nitrogen. We've got a vibrational and uh, rotational component here. Uh, this is a somewhat complicated looking shot plot. This is the inverse of a relaxation rate in the nitrogen. On this side is, um, it's, it's a complicated way of looking at temperature ratio. On this side would be an area associated with a compression region. This side would be associated with an expansion region. And what Tom's showing with the simulations is that on the compression side, we get a relaxation rate that is fairly uh, fast. On the expansion side, that relaxation rate is fairly slow. This is new insight. We haven't seen this before. And in fact, the, uh, the, 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 the standard for CFG simulations is to pick just the equilibrium state here with a, a, rich, a rate value of about 6. Use that for all our simulations. We'll go back to our shock tunnel model. If I'm going to rapidly compress and expand something, I've got two dramatically different processes at play here, and two different types of rates will be applicable. Well, we've just fudged it all with just one single equilibrium rate, which apparently isn't applicable, and we're going to have to uh, start implementing better models. We're going to get this right in the future. Uh, we have a Murray that looks at gas surface interactions as well. Um, excited to start working with the materials community, uh, getting involved with some other work there. And, and it starts basically with, uh, inter again, the interatomic potential computed from the chemistry community. This is what we call the REACTS FF, reactive force field modeling. We want to take that, scale it up in the molecular dynamics simulations, and then eventually uh, integrate the whole thing into continuum models, CFD for large scale uh, types of flow fields. Along the way, we want to use things such as molecular beam experiments and some very detailed uh, experiments on, on specific surface uh, uh, properties to try and, and, and pace what we're doing and ensure we're getting the computational sol solutions right along the way. Um, as part of this effort, Erica Corral at the University of Arizona, who has uh, previously been involved, uh, supported by my, our materials group, is doing some work, uh, again, to, to bring materials work into our, uh, the aerial community. Uh, what I want to show here is that if you look at different types of, of carbon uh, materials, uh, the different types of materials have a different mass loss rate as you heat them up. Uh, and it's an oxidation effect here. What they're realizing is that the way they do these types of, uh, of experiments and the de detailed structure of, of the material here it influences the type of uh, mass loss and oxidation data you get out of this type of thing. So Erica's group is taking a new approach to this. Um, they're basically, instead of heating the oxidizing environment in the material sample and looking at the response, they're holding it at a constant temperature up to a certain point, then switching on the oxidizing environment and trying to understand the, uh, the response at that point. The bottom line through all this is that they're getting cleaner data now uh, for, the, uh, for the oxidation rates with these different types of, of materials. And the key thing for me is not a materials guy, is that they're now getting better data on the surface conditions that we then couple with our aerothermodynamic uh, computational approaches. And, and we've got a more 
uh, scientifically uh, feasible or, you know, we have more confidence in the data now as we try to bring these two communities together. Uh, so I'm excited about this, and we're learning a lot from the material science community as we work together in this Murray. Uh, my other program managers who I partner with on this are Ali Sayer and Mike Berman. So um, let's summarize. Uh, I used an example of pizza delivery to try and give you the idea that perhaps high-speed systems could allow us to improve the efficiency with the way we do certain things. Um, there are not a, a lot of challenges in my portfolio. Uh, it operates at the intersection of thermophysics, turbulence, and chemistry. Uh, within, I think, the big picture, my portfolio plays a leading role in the international research community. I'm really proud of my PIs. They are truly world class. Um, we are trying to change the way that we think about the portfolio. Um, energy transfer to small scales drives macroscopic flow behavior. We want to start thinking about this in these terms to allow us to communicate more readily with the rest of the scientific community and build some bridges with other disciplines as well. My, my secret goal in all of this is to have to have some of my guys who are award winners within the aerospace community suddenly becoming award winners in other disciplines in the next few years. Uh, we've got good people. I'd like to start exporting them. Uh, and finally, in the research highlights, I hope you walk away with the idea that our PIs are conducting exciting, world-leading research and they're really good at what they do. So uh, thank you very much. I'd be very pleased to take questions at this time. Uh, it depends how much pizza is on your butter, or butter is on your pizza. There's probably a crust coefficient we haven't taken account of. Uh, John, not, not really a question, just a, just a thank you for, uh, for helping to bring a lot of different ed agencies together on energy efficiency. That's, uh, that's really important work. Thank you very much. Questions? Comments? Tired? Y'all may not want to leave me a few minutes. The actual <laughs> original title of my talk was going to be Pizza Skeet Shooting and the Future of Aerothermodynamics. And I have a, I have a prepared analogy no. on how no. program management and skeet no. shooting, which is one of my hobbies, is similar. I didn't think it would translate well, so we not, elected not to go in there. So it made their choices. Go to lunch, or I could talk for a few more minutes on skeet shooting. Uh, perhaps you're going to go to lunch, I guess. Yes. Um,